Hello, and welcome to The Kosh. I'm your host, Timber Smith, and The Kosh is a podcast that spotlights people who've had an association with Kosh and the surrounding Fox Cities area. Hello, Kosh listeners. How are we doing today? I am fantastic today. I feel good. The energy is good. The weather is good. Oh, and don't let me forget, I want to make sure that I let y'all know that This episode of The Kosh is sponsored by Sturgeon Spirits, The Kosh's newest tradition. Hello, my friends over there at Sturgeon Spirits. And if y'all have not slipped down to Sturgeon Spirits and had a The Kosh cocktail, I'm calling y'all out. What you waiting for? What's going on? You scared? You scared? All right, don't be scared. Check it out. Okay, so... You know, this is this is a, a long weekend, three day weekend, holiday weekend. I am excited. You know what? There's a ritual that I have. Gosh, listen, I think y'all know that I make salsa and I make hot sauce. Now I don't make just any salsa or any hot sauce. I make like some of the best and the greatest salsa and hot sauce on the planet. I'm just gonna call it out for what it is. But it has to start with the at the beginning, and the beginning is this, I have to plant a garden. So this is garden planning weekend. And what typically happens is my my uh, my brother and sister-in-law, the Weisses, big shout out to the Weisses, come over with this humongous rototiller. This thing is like, because they have a farm. So they've got this rototiller, it's, it's like half of a semi-truck. And I wrestle this rototiller around my little old garden. And it's a it's an event because they they bring it they actually load it into a truck for me bring it all the way over to the house get it there and then the fun begins because they go sit in lawn chairs and they watch me toil with this the, this rototiller as I'm sweating dying wrestling and they're they're dr- usually drinking cocktails and giggling because this, but this has been going on for over a decade so I do believe this is the day that this ritual will happen which means that in our near future, there will be yummy hot sauce and salsa, kosh style facts. Okay, now let's get down to business business. And I, you know, let me just say this. Once again, I am really excited about today because, you know, I think you know what I'm going to say. Maybe you know what I'm going to say. Well, if you're a kosh listener, you know what I'm going to say. I don't know how I continue (laughs) to get these amazing, amazing guests. And this week is no different. I am fired up for this guest because I just, at the minute that I met them, there's there's this energy, there's a synergy happening. And I think this conversation is about to be fire. So without any further ado, this week's guest is Nicole Millard. Did I get that right? Yes. Oh, impressive. You first did not try. Say Millard. No, no. Well, that would have had an A in it, right? Yes. And there's a, maybe I'll use that as my story. There's a little funny story with my name that I can tell you later. Oh, <laughs> we want all the stories here on the Kosh. Well, Nicole, how's your day going? It is going pretty fantastic. This is slightly early for me, but I'm all about it. It's good. It's a beautiful day to be up early. You, well, you know, you know why we do the Kosh so early? Because we we're trying to harness people's best energy that's like it that. yes because the mind is going yes and i already see you've got you've got premium starbucks going on over there so what it what that's saying is you you've you've caffeinated <laughs> i'm getting there <laughs> or quarter caffeinated Qu- quarter caffeinated you did walk in with the vetti <laughs> <laughs> you ain't playing okay well nicole can you please share a little something about yourself and your connection with the surrounding Fox Cities area in the Kosh? Sure. So I am individual private practice therapist. So it's just me and my little old, old office. I'm in downtown Oshkosh. So Main Street, the venue 404, that building that they filmed Public Enemy in, we've got a, quite a little therapist community going on in there. I, before I was in private practice, so I did private practice probably about 2020 during the pandemic, I just sort of started to feel like, uh, I need to do something different. And there is this need 
Before that, I was working in the prison system, which is a really important work. And it was hard for me to leave that because I felt the calling to be there. But also it got to be very frustrating work in that, you know, the things that I felt I could do to help people weren't necessarily possible in that environment. And there was a lot of institutionalized policies and things that just didn't really go along with what I considered to be healing work. So I worked there for 10 years and then... I left and I'm now in private practice and I totally love it. I'm my own boss, which is also very nice because I learned in the prison system. Sometimes I don't like other people telling me what to do. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, my parents probably aren't shocked about that one. But yes, prior to, you know, being in the prison system and being a therapist, I was an English teacher. So I did that. When I lived in Nevada, a suburb of Las Vegas called Henderson, and came back to Oshkosh because my family's out here. I guess I'm kind of mixing these two questions together, but I was born here in Oshkosh, North Sider, went to Reed Elementary, if that means anything to anyone, kind of that area of town. You know, they just put up a cool mural. Oh, I have to go check it out. Yes, that that happened. Big, big shout out to Jen and uh, to Nao. There was this partnership. Oh, and, and Aaron Sher. We got a shout out Aaron too. But they there's this actually it started from a conversation, people connecting because they were guests on the Kosh. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. And I have to check it out. I love that that school is, you know, historic. That I come back and I'm like, oh, I went to someone historic. Because when I moved to Nevada, is like everything's brand new there. There was no history besides, you know, mop stuff, maybe, and that wasn't great history. But yeah. And then Came back to Oshkosh when I was 30, so there was a big chunk of time. I lived in Henderson and Vegas, depending. I went to UNLV for my undergrad, so if anybody was basketball fans in the 80s and 90s, they were a big deal before the controversy came about (laughs) with Tarkanian. Yeah, and I taught out there for a while, kind of felt called to come back to where some of my family was. My, you know, grandmother was aging. I wanted to spend some time with her, and be around some of my other family members, then kind of just stayed. <laughs> you boomeranged. Yes, boomerang West Coast, Midwest. I've oh. never gotten to the East Coast, so maybe that's my next journey. <laughs> you know what? What's funny is that there's a series of people that I think have, from Oshkosh or the region, who have moved to Nevada, Las Vegas, or Reno region to retire. Oh. And I was like, okay. I guess I could see that. I mean, as I get older, I might not want to do seasons, but I kind of like seasons. Seasons are nice. That's actually part of why, besides the family factor, I wanted to come back is you do, there's almost a sense of like reverse seasonal depression when all you see is the sun for like 350 days of the year and you're just like, I would like some rain, please. (laughs) (laughs) I would even take some cold weather and snow. For like the first five years I was back, I was like, yeah, bring on the blizzards. And, you know, now it's been 12 or 13. And I'm like, eh, never mind. Yeah, I bet you ain't feeling the same way now. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, I I could go visit Nevada in the winter now, and I'd be okay with that. Yeah, snowbird it out. (laughs) Okay, well, that's, that's an interesting trip. And the fact that you ended up, and you you decided to teach in there. Did you teach at the collegiate level too? I did do, um, not in Nevada, but here I did some adjunct work for UWO in the social work department. So my original teaching, I was an English teacher for junior high, a little bit of high school. When I came back to Wisconsin, I did that a little bit, but it was right in the middle of all that, like, Scott Walker taking oh, like, there, everything was yeah. getting worse. There as was a, a hot, hot mess going on. Yes. And it was really hard to find a job and I was tired of it. I was doing a lot of like long term subbing. I was at one point I did get hired in Manitowoc, but I was driving from Oshkosh to Manitowoc Ooh. along Highway 10. And so all of my learning to drive formative years had been in Nevada where there is no weather, there is no snow, there is no rain. <laughs> so when winter came and I was driving an hour and like 15 minutes from Oshkosh to Manitowoc and it was like 2008 maybe when we had like 80 inches of snow, I was terrorized. I was having like panic attacks. It was taking me like three hours <laughs> to get home at night. And oh, you like, were getting beat up. Yeah, I was like, this is not for me. And all my kids have always told me, it's funny, they're like, 
you're a good teacher because you care about the subject and you love, you know, talking about books, but you really hate disciplining, which is totally true. I'm not one for like sending people to the office or the dean or detention. So like, you'd be a better counselor than our counselor. You listen better and she's better at disciplining us. So it seems wrong. I'm like, ah, children are really smart. There's probably something to this. So when I came back here and I wasn't finding a job, I'm like, maybe I get my master's degree in something that can help me be more of a, like a counselor and a listening person. And I decided social work gives you like so many different options, it does. which I love. Cause at first I thought like, Oh, I'm going to work with kids. I'm going to be doing like CPS or something, but that destroyed my soul. <laughs> you, you know, that's funny. Cause I started off one of my majors back in the day was social work. And then I tell people part of the thing that chased me away from social work is like, some of the things you have to do as a social worker because I couldn't I couldn't agree with them. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't remove kids because of poverty or something like that. When you know poverty doesn't mean that you're not loving your kids well. It just means that you 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 you're resource challenged, right? Yeah. And I I couldn't do that because I don't think that's the answer. And watching it happen to the kids, I knew that wasn't the answer because. You know, when I had to take a kid out of a situation, and I didn't even get to the point where I was, like, working in CPS. I was just a supervised visitation worker, and I was doing, like, an internship with the county. And I'm like, these kids are not okay. And putting them into other situations that oftentimes aren't even culturally appropriate are not okay. And it just, yeah, it didn't sit well with me. And then I ended up doing my second internship in a prison, at the mental health prison, WRC here in the lake. I was like, oh, I know this seems ridiculous, but there's more healing to be done here with the people that have already experienced all of the bad things and, you know, helping them heal and maybe getting them out and helping them be better parents is a felt like a better option to me than trying to, that system was so skewed. I could get that. I could get that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Let's talk about that. Let's, because that, I think that's a fascinating place to be and I think we often when people go through our correctional system right and you're convicted and time has to be served and stuff and then I feel like we as society don't good, do a good job of of forgiving and then also reintroducing those individuals back into, you know, our society so they can be productive and do good things and, and give them their earned second opportunity at good citizenry, right? Or or I shouldn't even say citizenry, I should just say good community member, mm -hmm. right? Would did people question the need to be for the that population a need therapeutic therapeutic guidance? What did you learn in that space? From those individuals? I think the number one thing I learned is that people don't do bad things or commit crimes in a vacuum. Like they don't just decide one day, like I'm going to do this thing that is against the laws of our society. It's an ongoing historical systemic thing. So like poverty, not having parents in the home, not feeling a proper attachment, experiencing some huge trauma, usually some kind of sexual assault, you know, being in the foster care system as much as and that goes back to the CPS thing. When we take kids out of their homes and put them in the foster system, it's oftentimes not a better space because there are a lot of scary things that go on with people that become foster parents, unfortunately. And I think people that would be great foster parents are kind of scared away from it. And leaving space for people that maybe don't have the best intentions because the stories I've heard, that's, I think this is why that appealed to me. Like, I'm a person that loves stories and this is why I'm interested in your podcast, right? I love to hear people's stories. And when I hear that, I'm like, yes, these things that happened to them created an environment where they can make these poor choices. And it's on us and me as a healer and on others 
as a society to make a world where these people can feel safe enough to have the opportunity to make good choices. Because given that opportunity, like 99.9% of people will. There's like maybe a 0.001, I'm not good at like statistics, but a very small percentage of people that will maybe inherently make the wrong choice or be quote unquote bad people. But I've, you know, again, 10 years in the prison system, I came across very few of them. And it always goes back to like what happened to you. And when you see what happened to them, you can understand how do they got how they got to this point. And yes, they deserve healing and they deserve to take that healing out into the community and have a really ample opportunity to make a life for themselves instead of getting, you know, sucked back into a system, which is, you know, just another way of enslaving people, in my opinion, right? Because it makes it really hard sometimes when people get out. We don't have a lot of good systems in place to help. And it's so hard to make people feel safe and competent enough that they can live a life on the outside if they've spent an entire life on the inside, inside, right? Right. No, that makes, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. Did you work primarily with women or men? I started working with men and then they're in the the environment I was working, they had a trauma program that was for the women from the women's prison and they would bring them to us and we would work with them on a very specific program on healing their traumas that involved group and individual therapy. And it felt really valuable. And I think because I'm a woman, I felt even more attuned and empathetic to the, you know, the things that caused women to become incarcerated because a lot of time it was like, relationship trauma and attachment trauma and things like that and I was like oh I understand this and I can help with this because I've I you know I've experienced not I would say to the extent that most of the clients I worked with there but as a woman many of us have experienced some kind of physical or sexual trauma in our lives which is unfortunate but I felt more more useful I guess sometimes like the the gender gap especially in prison because they made a big deal about like women working with men how careful you had to be in all those things you could get hurt or you could get this and that which I never had that experience but it was an easier one what what's the biggest difference between that environment and now being in private and what, what do you run in What are interesting things that you've learned between the two? I think the the main difference is my ability as a clinician to choose what route of therapy I think is best and to have the opportunity to not be like confined within a small area or a small office. Like if a client is dealing with anxieties and exposure to something would be helpful, you know, we can go out into the community and address that. I can create a space in my office that is authentic to myself and the way that I provide therapy, but also like relaxing and non, non-clinical in the way that it doesn't feel like institutionalized. I think the institutionalization of things makes it hard for people to open up. But other than that, like the... The stories are the same. It's just looking at clients that maybe didn't get involved in the system is like, okay, where did they have those protective factors in terms of like some supportive person that was there to keep them from kind of going down a path that could lead to prison? And, you know, I lost my train of thought. (laughs) I got another great question. Do you have a specialty focus I would say my specialty focus is trauma, women who have experienced trauma, because that's what I've spent the most time on, and that's what I have the most understanding of. If we're saying, like, specific modalities of therapy, I use EMDR. I'm training and learning a lot about internal family systems as well. I really love that. I use a little bit of DBT. I was very extensively trained in DBT in the prison system okay now you're using all these acronyms <laughs> let me just say some i didn't know anything you yes. really just said to me can you break that down <laughs> I can. ah the acronyms okay so emdr is a kind of trauma therapy it stands for and it's so bulky i wish they would have called it something else i've movement 
<laughs> desensitization and reprocessing. It's basically like the things that you do to help reprocess the trauma. The eye movement part is bilateral eye movements. It's a very goofy thing where you hold your fingers in front of somebody's eyes and they follow your fingers. You can also use like a light bar or a stick or something. Over time, if they've also involved other kinds of bilateral stimulation, I like pulsers, which are these things you hold in your hands and they vibrate back and forth. But it just kind of helps with moving some, moving along the natural healing process of your brain for a very non-technical way of putting it. So it's a nice way. It's very effective. Looks at not only helping your brain kind of move the processing and the healing along, but also, you know, how do you bring, the, you know, the body sensations into it? Trauma is remembered and felt more often in the body than cognitively because, you know, cognitively sometimes when you're in a trauma situation, your kind of brain shuts down the parts of it that remember not with your body. So it's very, like, holistic. I love that. The IFS is internal family systems. Again, it's just another sort of, like, holistic, somatic way of looking at trauma. We look at parts of ourselves that have experienced the trauma, parts that have developed in order to protect the traumatized parts and try to protect us going forward. But if you're trying to protect yourself based on something that happened to you as a child in your adult life, that always doesn't work and kind of can have unintended unintended negative consequences. And DBT is the last one I said, I think. That's dialectical behavioral therapy. And the part about DBT I enjoy and focus on the most is it the skills that are involved with it. So they have four different areas. They have skills. There's mindfulness, interpersonal effectiveness, emotion regulation, and distress tolerance. So just kind of basic life skills that if you grow up in a chaotic environment where you don't have people that are, you know, around enough to kind of teach you these skills, to reinforce them, learn them as an older person. And it really helps. And it helps everybody. They should teach this in school. It really is not like subjective to a personality disorder or anything like that. We all need these skills. Now, some of this sounds familiar because I just I just listened to this book. It's an Oprah book, and I think it's called What Happened yes, to You. It's so good. That is such a good book. And um, I learned a lot. Well, basically, I learned that most of the things that you're messed up about happened in your childhood. Yes. <laughs> That's why you're messed up now. <laughs> and they're not even necessarily intended messed up things, right? We all have something that just affects us in some way because – we always try to do better each generation, but then it's almost like tr in trying to do better, something else might sort of imbalance. And yes, so always ask what happened to you with a person right. versus what's wrong with you. Right. Okay. If you weren't doing what you're doing now professionally, what would you like to be doing? Well, my, my childhood dream was to be an author. And still in the back of my head, I think I might actually finish something I have about... I don't know, 10 started novel experiences, and I, I struggle with the completion <laughs> part of it. But I always thought when I was a kid I was going to be like the female version of Stephen King because I'm a little bit deranged in the things I could come up with in my head. Other than that, if, you know, I had unlimited resources, like I won the lottery, I'd love to just like start foundations for the various things that I'm passionate about, which are ever expanding, but... Definitely for women who have been incarcerated and are trying to get back into their lives, especially the women that have children and are struggling with, you know, the system trying to keep their children away from them because of their incarceration. I have a lot of feelings about that. I would love to have, you know, little communities for people that are homeless or previously been incarcerated that would draw in, like, all of the important things, right? So you have the housing provided, you have maybe a little coffee joint, you have a little like a cat room or a dog run, and you have opportunities to work, and you have therapy that's built into it with group and individual, because I know those two things go together so, so well, and really, really help people heal. So that would be a, like utopian communities, I'd create little mini ones here and there. I love that. That's kind of fantastic. Well, that just means you got work to do. I know, so much. I don't know if I have enough time left you, in my life wait, for all these things. You've got time. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it, it happens faster than you think once the ball is rolling. At least that's what I like to tell myself. You ready to jump into the first segment? Yes. All right. The first segment is called What in the World is Going on With? That's where we start with the phrase, what in the world, and then you tell us what's on your mind. So, Nicole, what's on your mind? This one was a struggle for me because everything is always on my mind. I do have a tinge of my own ADD going on here that was undiagnosed as a child. That happens with women a lot, by the way, because women kind of internalize our systems while men externalize ADD symptoms. So I have a lot of disorganization in my brain, but it's all for like a good, mostly good kind of reason. However, yes, what in the world is going on with the future? So I always laugh. My significant other is he's so into like cyberpunk and future oriented things. And he's always saying like, it's so crazy. Like the future is right now. And that really is true. Like all of these things that when I was younger back in the day, that would be so weird to me being true now, like aliens and artificial intelligence. Like they're so real. Like, yeah, the government is acknowledging aliens exist. And like the Navy is all like, yeah, we saw all these UFOs or UAPs or whatever they're calling them nowadays. And the stuff with AI really creeps me out. So that was kind of my initial thought is just like, oh, my God, like the future is right now. And it's it's so much what we thought about it would be, but also so different. Like there's not a robot making my breakfast, but there's like a robot that can write my notes if I want to. <laughs> and they just haven't released the robot that makes your breakfast yet. <laughs> That's the one I want. Or that cleans the house better. I mean, we're getting there with the little I love my shark vacuum do you have one of those (laughs) oh they're so great i hate vacuuming i'm gonna i'm not gonna lie i think bosco the podcast dog would box ours he'd be like (laughs) nah this this is we both can't live here there's problems my dog very gently avoids it every once in a while it'll like bumper and she's just like (laughs) i agree with you you first of all i always think that whoever creates movies really has the pulse on the future and you know what i remember it was this was a long time ago remember the movie gremlins ah uh, yes so i loved gremlins but there was a long period of time where i didn't watch gremlins again and then it was like i don't know 10 years later or 15 years later i watched gremlins and remember the dad was an inventor mm-hmm. well everything he invented existed <laughs> right, right? It, at the time of gremlins it seemed really far out but then like all the all of the stuff that he invented really wasn't even novel and some of it had already come and gone. And and so I'm always thinking like we really are in that space where like so what I'm hoping for is like I want some Iron Man technology. Like straight I want a Jarvis. Yes. Even though I mean we're close. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna lie, I do have my house is almost entirely smart. Nice. So like you can walk through this joint and we can, we can do things in here, and uh, <laughs> but I, it's not Jarvis level yet. Yes, getting that. I'm probably ten years, which is kind of like cool and scary at the same time. A little bit. I don't know. I'm not scared of tech like that. I'm only scared of tech when we no longer can control tech, and that's what we just need to make sure. It's like tech doesn't pull I need a her YouTube to stop showing me those videos. <laughs> Got a bad algorithm going on where oh. it's like it's gonna take over everything. Oh, I'm you like, got no. a, you got a bad algorithm. <laughs> That's not good. All right, my what in the world is going on with has to do with so what in the world is going on with random folks rolling up on you at seven thirty in the morning trying to start some nonsense. Oh, no. Now, yeah. Let, let me tell you, Bruh. I feel some kind of way about this. I was, I literally, I was on my way to a meeting, right? And I don't typically roll into the office at 730, but I had to get to a board meeting this particular morning. And I was like, all right, so I'm coming out and I get, we got to park in a parking ramp and then our walk to where I have to go to work and where I was going to this board meeting. It's about a clean block maybe a block and a quarter because there's so much construction happening in Appleton. Right. So I'm going there and there's this dude. Now there's this dude is a dude that like, he's infamously known for like kind of being a community rabble rouser and just causing issue. Like, and he's a conspiracy 
conspiracy theorist, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I've run into him before, but I always, like, I really do hold the point of view of, like, I don't care who you are. I'm going to treat you with some respect, right? So I've run into him before on the street. He's got a, he got a megaphone. He usually has a big sign. He's usually bad-mouthing our, our, our uh, leadership of the city is what I will say. Not for any real reason, but just because, right? And he claims to be like a former uh, former informant to the police and just all of this stuff, right? And I don't know if any of it's true or not. I'm just going to go with I. it gives me pause and I have great doubt. <laughs> Let's just say the let's just say the presentation isn't isn't the, the most impressive <laughs> at the end of the day. So nonetheless, I, when I see him on the street, I just always try to say, hey, I acknowledge him, say hello, you know, and I always just tell him something like, you know, keep doing what you're doing, man. Do you, you know, don't you know, because I don't treat him like he's not human. I just refuse to do that to people. Uh-huh. This is. This individual decided at 7.30 in the morning he was going to roll up on me. And I mean roll up on me like he came a half a block racing at me with a phone in hand. So then you know he's recording me and he's trying to agitate me into saying something detrimental. Jeez. Right? And, like, I had so many mixed emotions. First of all, I was just like getting my stuff together. It's seven thirty. I'm trying to make it to this meeting in time. So, dude, what is you doing? <laughs> Number two, like, dude, I, every time I've seen you, I've treated you with respect. Why you? Why you come at? Why you running at me with the phone? I wanted to slap the phone out of his hand, but here's what I, you know, luckily, <laughs> I meditate, and <laughs> and also. The fact that I'm really big on this, I do not, I know that there's forces out there that when you don't have, you feel your job is to make others not have like you. My real beef with him is this, don't mess up my money, bro. Don't do that. Like, you know, you know, you know what I do. You know what I'm trying to do. I ain't caused you no harm. A brother trying to keep a paycheck and you trying to mess up my paycheck, man. You trying to make me. Get get myself worked up, catch me out here, make me go viral, and make me move furniture with you. And I ain't trying, <laughs> I ain't trying to do that, right? Now, I'm a nice, nice person, but I'm also still a grown ass man. Yes. And so there comes points where you know there's limits to everything. But I just and then it was seven thirty, so I was all in my feelings about this whole thing, and yeah. Needless to say, he did record me and publish me and oh then God. use a tagline because, you know, when he, he was trying to, he agitated the whole scenario, but then he tried to back down when he saw how I was reacting to it because I was like, dude, why are you doing this? I was like, you know, I ain't come at you like that. And then he went ahead and was like, well, you know, just shake my hand. And then I was like, nah, man, I ain't shaking your hand, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, so you ain't going to shake my hand. Well, that's what he made the caption of the video. Oh, my God. And then, you know, I had some gear on for my job. So then he's all on my logo of my gear and saying, this guy is representing the city. And da, 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 da. And, and I was just like, man, why, why, man? Yeah, what is wrong with people? Like, why? Yeah, uh, I mean. 730 I in the morning. But, and that's probably purposeful too like nobody's awake and able to use all of their my coffee wouldn't have like kicked in yet so I would have probably not been as kind as I would have like two hours later oh that's horrible no it was horrible and so you know I'm let's just say what in the world is going on with that like don't do that don't do that to people don't don't rabble rouse folks and why do you have to like make it viral or video t- like can Yes. That's not authentic. Then you're trying to create something to either put some kind of attention on yourself or to like harm you and you, for no good reason. He doesn't even know you and you've been nothing but kind to him. I, 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 I am serious about this. I have certain ethics about like people, particularly like when I'm dealing with people that I know are, are challenged as far as whether it's financially challenged and maybe they're, maybe they're unhoused or just, don't have the ability to provide. I, I'm very 
very, very understanding of individuals who, who have neurodiversity situations. You know, and, and once again, I'm always going to look you in your eye. I'm always going to greet you. And I'm always going to treat you as the human you are with the respect you deserve. That's where that's my baseline. That's where I start with. So when people come out there and they trying to cause harm and my main harm is this, like I didn't feel physically challenged in any kind of way, but don't mess with my paycheck player. <laughs> there is no love on that one. Don't come for my check. And you're focusing on the wrong people. If that's the goal, like, you know, us people in the middle are not necessarily the focus that needs to be had. If you want to go for somebody's paycheck, like go for the big ones that Bruh. do the things that create the environment that you are disturbed by. Well, I'm not saying he was going for my paycheck, but what I'm saying is like, that's the kind of stuff that causes you to lose. One. Yeah. You know, don't do that. Don't do that. You know? So, all right. That's my, what in the world is going on with now. We're ready to move on to the next great segment. And this segment, I've been feeling this segment lately. And uh, why do I feel like this? We're going to get great things from you in this segment. And this segment is known as 21 Questions. We don't have 21 questions, but we might get 21 amazing answers from these questions. Nicole, are you ready? I am ready. All right. What are you grateful for? Uh, grateful. I love gratefulness. As a therapist, it's an important part of just, you know, what we do is to, to focus. And I love that you asked this first, too. That, like, makes me happy. But, yes, if we can, because there's always going to be things not to be grateful for, but the opposite is also true. So if we can really, like, hone in and focus on those things that we are grateful for, from the big ones to the little ones, it really creates a life that at the end of it is, you know, something you look back on and say, like, this was worth living. This was awesome. So for me, those things of like, you know, obvious answers, of course, are my significant other, Jason. He's an amazing human. He has helped me grow and expand in ways that I didn't know I needed to and didn't know were possible. He was the person that encouraged me, you know, like that my old job was unfulfilling and kind of sucking up my soul and like killing me with stress in a really negative fashion, encouraged me to go out into private practice and to sort of do my own thing. And now I'm in a space where I'm like, I feel amazing and I love what I do so much. So I'm so grateful for him for just being an amazing partner and for like pushing me outside of my comfort zone all of the time. Even coming here, I was like, I don't know if I should do this. He's like, yes, you should do this. <laughs> and go in there and have fun. Wait, thank you, Jason. Bruh. <laughs> <laughs> and also I have the most amazing dog. Bosco is also amazing, but I love my little Winnie. She's just this hound dog with the softest ears. Even the vet said so, so I'm not being biased. And she just gives me all of the love that I need at the end of the day. They kind of, when you're in like the therapy sort of sector or when you do things where you, you know, take on a lot of other people's emotions, sometimes I come home full of them and she's a good receptacle for that. She just, you know, lets me pet her and let go of a lot of it. So I'm grateful for that. And also, oh, power, right? So Tuesday night, I lost my power for the first time in the seven years I've lived in this house for more than like, you know, a flicker coming on and off type of thing. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm very, very grateful for this because not having it was, it was out for like four hours. I don't know if you guys lost yeah, it. Yeah, we lost here. it. But I was like, dang, this sucks. I, all these weird things I can't do and I'm worried about my food and I, I can't literally see cause it was pitch black and I was like, Oh, so I'm very grateful for power. Um, Oh, and then I did want to say on a deeper level. So th this is therapist me again. I'm really grateful for the challenges I've experienced and the failures I've had because I do feel like those things have, you know, again, like led me to where I am right now in this, this place of fulfillment so if I hadn't, you know, failed at being a teacher, I would have never gone into social work. I never would have been in the prison system. I never would be where I am right now. So if that hadn't felt like a failure back then, I wouldn't be where I am at this moment. And that goes with a lot of other things too, like relationships that I failed at brought me to this relationship that makes me feel amazing right now. So that's the other thing when I think about gratefulness. And I remind clients of this as well. It's just like, 
embrace the things that are failures. Don't be afraid of them because they are going to bring you to the place you need to be. And then it's going to feel really beautiful. What motivates you? Motivates me. How? Let's see. Hoping to make a positive impact in the world and that sense of continuously destigmatizing mental health. I think we're getting there. We're on the right track. Definitely different from when I was, you know, younger and growing up when therapy wasn't even a thing anyone in my family would have considered or even talked about. But just understanding that we all exist in a spectrum of having mental health issues of some sort of another, just the same as we all have a propensity towards some kind of like physical health things and that it's okay to seek help for those things and there shouldn't be a stigma about it and, you know, embrace all the things that make you, you, even if, you know, the DSM might diagnose you with something. What grounds you? What grounds me? Well, the aforementioned puppy dog ears are like the best thing. They're just so soft. They just bring me into the moment and leave things behind. A hug from my significant other. So Jason gives the best hugs. I appreciate those. I also like some physical exertion will like ground me into the moment. Like running was my thing for a long time before I kind of hurt myself and I'm kind of building back up to it. But I like rowing too. Coffee is grounding. And then I, the last part I thought of was using the coping skills that I tell my clients to use. So trying my best not to be hypocritical. So again, those DBT skills, especially those mindfulness ones can really ground you and bring you into the moment and remind you that you can deal in the present with what you have control over and let the future and the past be the future and the past. What does success look like to you? This one kind of feels loaded for me because I always feel that I'm at odds with what society tells me success should be. So my success is, you know, right now being my own boss in charge of my own destiny, just like doing what I need to do. But that also means like not not in the sense of like the hustle culture thing, right? Where I have to be like hustling 24-7 and I have to have my business like thriving and I have to be making like 200K or some kind of thing. Like all those Instagram ads are like, if you're a fill in the blank for profession, you should be making this many thousands of dollars more than you are by our program. I don't want any of that. I just want to structure my life where I work enough to make a difference and feel good, but also have time for the other things that matter to me, my passions that might not be, you know, financially productive, but also just make me feel good about myself, spending time with my family and friends, my pets. And then if I were to create ultimate success, again, I'm very like pie in the sky person. It would be a society where everyone is taken care of and has their basic needs met. So we don't have all of these systemic issues that come from the base problem or the root cause of people not having their needs met, not being taken care of. Like that would be ultimate success for me. I don't know if I'll get there. So I'll focus on, you know, just doing my own thing and (laughs) spending time with people I love. What irritates you? People that are unwilling to consider another point of view or try to understand one another because What I've learned about myself is things that I thought were to be true. Eventually, over time, I found through, like, considering others' perspectives, like, there was more to it, right? So if we just kind of keep these very rigid black and white ideals of, like, this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is bad, whatever the case may be, we're not allowing... A, us to come together as like a people and a community and create change and solve problems because we're so stuck in our other, you know, our this and that. And it keeps us from actually connecting. And going back to that like DBT idea, which I really love, there's this, I don't have a lot of time to, it would take hours to talk about, but this idea of dialectics where you know, we want to be in the shades of gray and that there is our kernel of truth in every person's point of view or perspective. So there's a reason why that's their point of view or perspective. And in trying to understand that, that's how we get closer to, you know, a connection where we can make things better. So in understanding others, we create 
change, if that makes any sense. I feel like I've gone way off topic. Like, yeah, that's my pet peeve. If people won't do that. <laughs> no, there. first of all, this is the kosh. <laughs> and there is no Bruh. off topic. <laughs> there just isn't. If it made sense to you, it makes sense. All right. What scares you? Scares me is the division in this country. And again, this is where I maybe think about like those algorithms and stuff, right? That just feed us stuff that continues to put us in our tiny little boxes where we can't consider another point of view. And that's the part that scares me because I can't remember any time in my life where everything felt so divided that, you know, there's this one section of people and there's this other section of people and we just cannot come together on anything and all of our energy is focused on how bad the other side is and not on how to like create a, a solution and that makes me fear for you know the concept of like democracy as a whole in this country and just for like I don't know what's going to happen this election season scares me <laughs> facts I, I agree with you on that yeah, that's such a good point. And that is scary, the level of division that's going on. I just think the, the fact that there's just a whole scenario of individuals out there operating on their own set of facts <laughs> instead of the fact facts. That, that just, boggles my mind. That's just on some real different. And then that just makes it really hard to ever come kind of yeah. gather around towards a common common respect or uh like we can we can disagree on like the details of something or how it should be fixed or something but you know the facts are the facts yeah and all humans deserve all things and a, respect a and respect and a dignity like I, just because i disagree with you don't mean that i gotta disrespect you or discount you discount your viewpoint or think that you're less than because you don't agree with mine yes that's rough it's hard and it's scary. And when I see people getting like sucked down these rabbit holes of things, I'm just like, oh my God, like the amount of friends and or family members that are kind of distanced or lost is just really sad to me. What recharges your soul? It's my soul. A lot of the same things that ground me. I would think like the sense of like a good cup of coffee or good food oh my god good food the best and the worst way to recharge my soul because i love it so much i love a good like streaming netflix type binge just to veg out and let myself come back to reality afterwards yeah i'm not gonna lie that's dangerous time spent because once you find the wrong show mm -hmm. you're in the, it's a day gone i'm gonna watch the whole season Right? That's when you find a show that you didn't watch years ago and you're like, oh my gosh, like now I have to watch it all. <laughs> uh, here's the good one. How do you define love? I like this question. So for me, love is compassion and connection because I don't think you can truly experience love without that. And just sort of that ongoing commitment to those two values. So if you feel love towards a person, you know, it's not going to be always there, right? You're going to get frustrated with them. They're going to do things. There's no person that's never going to annoy you. And if that were the case, it would be a really boring world, right? Because <laughs> some of those annoyances actually create fun and change. But yeah, just that sense of like, you know, I'm committed to being compassionate. I'm committed to our connection. And I think that can be a societal level too, right? You can love the people around you and commit to connecting and being compassionate towards them and their situations. What is the most memorable life lesson you learned from a parent, a guardian, or a mentor? Um, when I think of life lessons, I mostly, I think about my dad. He recently-ish passed last September. That was hard for me because he really was a person like we weren't you probably wouldn't say like close in the sense like I want to spend all my time with you and, you know, you know, always doing things together. But he really gave me this sense of love for learning and literature in particular and trying to understand history and you know, a really 
useless love of trivia and like playing Trivial Pursuit and watching Jeopardy and things like that. But I, I think that was one of the best things I got from him was just like that love of all things knowledge and trying to fill myself with it even if I don't do anything with the knowledge that it's good just to have as much as of it you can have and to know that you're never going to have enough. There's always going to be more out there. I don't know what you're talking about. That love of trivia, that's useful <laughs> stuff. Are you that, are you that person? Are you that young lady? Oh yeah. I just love to learn everything about everything and then test it with, we used to have trivial pursuits sort of marathons during the holidays, which mostly just then turned into me and my dad because nobody else cared and they'd eventually fall out, but we could play that game forever and ever. <laughs> Note to self, add Nicole for speed <laughs> dial for <laughs> trivia games. Like <laughs> I love going to different venues around here and, and catching a trivia night and I, I want a baller team. Uh, <laughs> I would, I would be open to that. Nobody else really that I engage with is as interested. So <laughs> I just like to win. I mean, winning's fun. All right, fair enough. Okay, Nicole, you just got added to the trivia speed dial. And you also just completed 21 questions. Thank you. Okay, next segment. Next segment is word associations. This is where I say a word, and you're going to tell us what's on your mind. And... We have a tradition here on the Kosh. We start with the same word every time. It is the word of family. It is the word of love. It is the word of community. It is the word of happiness. And that word is food. Like I said earlier, my favorite, right? It recharges me. It is part of love. I think maybe going back to the last part to what my mom taught me is food is love. So anytime... Anything was going on where we were like making something up or having some connection or like a party or whatever. There's always food, right? The family foods that have to be there. I love all types of food. I think that's the other part is just like culture and food is so interesting to me. And like exploring other cultures through food is the favorite thing I've ever done. Anytime I go anywhere new, it's just like I have to find a little local whatever the heck where I'm going to get like the food that I haven't tasted before or prepared in a different way that I hadn't expected because my taste buds are expanding faster than my age. I think even they're like, yeah, more stuff. All right. I got two questions for you. What are you in charge of bringing to the family potluck? Oh, God. I don't know that there's this in charge. I always try to find something different because... Oh, you're that relative. Yeah. <laughs> I always got to bring, like, this seems different or this seems healthy. Like, I started with Thanksgiving a couple, God, probably 10 years ago now, but I decided we needed more vegetables, so I started bringing this sort of, like, roasted Brussels sprout squash mixture thing and anything that's just, like, different and new which honestly, my family is pretty Midwestern. They're not super interested in probably the best thing I make that they like is I'll do like a crock pot macaroni and cheese and I add like bacon and everything that's possibly bad for you into it. It's probably going to give somebody a heart attack at some point in their lives. Bacon's never bad. <laughs> that keeps me from being a vegetarian. I can't say no 100%. I love it, but... <laughs> What's your what's one of your favorite establishments around here right now that you like to go and indulge? I would say my top two are going to be Beckett's because they always bring a little bit of a, a flair to their food, and I you know I love the owners; they're they're great people. Oh, facts. I mean, Chris was on here; he was great. And then the Taqueria is my newest happy place mm. because it actually. So the thing I miss about living in Nevada, besides my friends and family there, are like the food because there's just a wider variety of it. And the taqueria to me tastes like that West Coast, like Mexican foods, you know. Oh, there, the so taqueria good. is nice. They do they do a nice job. They're they're tropical tacos. Oh my god. So good. And the elote, so good. So good. I love it all. Cocktail or beer? Most of the time, kind of a cocktail. If I'm drinking a beer, it's going to be like at a baseball game when it's sunny, and then I'll go for like a summer shandy type of thing. But cocktails, there's more you can experiment with there. Love a margarita. 
back to Taqueria, they have a great margarita. Wine probably is my number one thing because it pairs really well with various foods. At one point in my life, I was all about like exploring wine and how it tastes with different foods. And of course, listening to jazz while I'm doing it to be a cliche. <laughs> mm. With that summer shanty is nice. It, you know what? The nice thing about summer is like you, you do change your cocktails for the summer. Yes. Yes. And I am in that transformation point myself. I'm getting ready for the full <laughs> summer cocktail option. My favorite is uh, and if y'all out there that ain't tried this before, let me put y'all on here, Kosh listeners. Have you find you a, a, a top shelf vodka? Not, not no rail, top shelf somewhere, and particularly a cucumber vodka oh. and a lemonade. The cucumber vodka, lemonade, and if they happen to have fresh mint, throw it in there. I promise you, it tastes like summer. It'll make you happy, and you can have a lot of them. That sounds good. It's I'll actually, try that. it's pretty fantastic. All right. Shop local. Always. No. I, I love all local things. Like I said, anytime I go someplace, I always try to find, like, local shops and local food that aren't chain related. Um, but I do love downtown Oshkosh just period. That's why I have my office there. I can't imagine having my office any place else. New Moon is one of my other favorite establishments and it's right across the street. Their coffee is so good. And I love that they, they bring it in from different places. My favorite is this goddess of darkness. First of all, the name is just cool. Second of all, it's like sourced, I'm trying to remember, I feel like it's maybe Peru, but it's all like a woman sort of owned and sourced company and like that itself seems so super, super cool. Yeah, so downtown Oshkosh, like Satori's is just like classic. I like to go in there and get, they have so many just random things like quirky clothes and little like decorations and cheap sunglasses because I constantly lose them. I used to have a nice little Satori t-shirt collection. Yes, those are classic. You know what? I don't see as many people wear those now. Ah, that's sad. I don't know. I, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> Gosh, listeners, if you know, you know. <laughs> what motivates you? What motivates me? Hmm. Oh, oh, you know what? I think I did not. F- I did not asked that question i think i missed that question on the you know what i'm going to come back to that question we're going to come back to that and instead because we are in words association let me go back concert concerts those are again things i love when i think about my most memorable it's when i got to go to Lollapalooza in 1994 it was probably like maybe the second or the third concert i ever really went to and we did the whole thing where we you know <laughs> camped out basically outside of the grocery store Smiths in our area so we could go to the ticket master inside and get the tickets and get them on time because it was going to sell out and all that stuff and it was 1994 so I got to see Smashing Pumpkins Beastie Boys what the Beastie which, Boys yeah. Not that there and I think I might have broken my toe at that point because it was when they came on, everyone went insane and my dumb self was wearing Birkenstocks because it was like 1994 and everybody just went Rah, and jumped and slammed down some guy's combat boot like right on my pinky toe and it hurt like heck for the rest of the day, but I was on too much adrenaline to care. But yeah, like that was amazing. Like George Clinton was there. What? Yeah, Bruh. it was cool. Like the breeders were there. It was supposed to be Nirvana, but it was like shortly before that, like Kurt died. So I was like, oh my God, this was like the ultimate concert for me back then. I still have the t-shirt from it, which is probably worth money, but I will never give up because <laughs> it was so amazing. Mm. And I did want to say, so now my significant other has had an influence on me into getting into Synthwave, which probably nobody knows about. I know we went to an Ollie Ride concert in Chicago at a really tiny venue, which is more congruent to my age now, right? Like I can't be surrounded by 8 million screaming, jumping, breaking my toe people (laughs) anymore. But 
it was really great. And he's an amazing performer. If you've never heard of him, look him up. He's got a great voice. Bruh. Wait a minute. I need to know what Synthwave is. You, <laughs> you, you just randomly throw that out there. And I know I'm not the only one sitting there with pause. We're all sitting there. Uh, what's Synthwave? I don't know what Synthwave is. It's kind of a, a smaller genre of just like bringing back some of that 80s synth sound and... Uh. Some of it is instrumental and doesn't even have vocals, but it's got that like 80s vibe to it. It's very nostalgic. Okay. I love 80s music. I mean, give me some Duran Duran. and I mean, yeah. <laughs> like that was really good stuff back then. They have, it's got some of that vibe with a little bit more current future-y stuff thrown in. Okay. I mean, well, I learned today. I'm going to actually go check out what synth Bruh. is. <laughs> Streaming. Ah. I love to stream. So I had a list. I have to consult my list here. So currently we're watching Under the Bridge, which I don't know if you heard about that, but it's a really crazy story. Mm -mm. It's based on this woman, Rebecca Godfrey, wrote a book back in probably like the early 2000s, late 90s. But there was a murder of a young 14-year-old girl in Canada she was killed by some of her peers in this kind of like crazy scenario where like first a bunch of them like beat her up and then two of the other ones like went and killed her. And then there's this investigation and they're trying to figure it out. It, it's, it's fascinating and sad and crazy all at the same time. So we've been watching that. Dark Matter is uh, what we were watching when the power went out and that probably was a bad experience or coincidence <laughs> because it's a creepy show and then suddenly we're in literal darkness i also like hacks we just finished binging atlanta that's the binge thing donald glover oh my god that guy is just like an amazing oh he's everything genius. he touches is golden and genius and from his music to any of his shows like that was we binged it in like probably a week it was crazy uh, oh, and I'm also waiting for Wednesday to come back because I love me some creepy stuff. And anything Mike Flanagan does, he's my spooky season go-to. I had heard Wednesday. Okay, f did you hear the rumor that Wednesday wasn't coming back at first? And then it turned around and you're like, oh, no, just kidding. It's coming. Did you, did that, I or was that so. just me? I think initially they, like, maybe scared you into making sure, like, you, you know, put it out on the social media that we need this back because it's, can't leave it where it left. Yeah, and Jenna Ortega is just cool. That was just a cool show. I I actually enjoyed that one quite a bit. And me and me and my wife were just having this whole conversation about Stranger Things. Like I'm frustrated with Stranger Things. Can we just can you bring us this last season, please? Yes, it's been so long. I forgot about it. Now, now and here's the funny thing. So like we were having, we literally were having a debate. Like why. You know what? Uh, let me just say this. God bless Google for saving marriages. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you what Google does. You, when you and your spouse are going through or your partner are going through whatever you're going through and you're arguing about said thing. And we were having this debate like how many years has it been or how long has it been since Stranger Things has ended? You, you, you talk to the Google machine and the Google machine can give you an honest answer. And then it, it all is well in the household. So I thought that. Stranger Things had been gone for at least three years. And my wife was under a year. Well, split the difference, it's been two years. <laughs> it feels like an eternity. And right. All of these children are now very grown up and getting married and all that kind of stuff. I think it even feels longer because there's been such huge gaps. Yes. And so, like, so I'm just hoping for the uh, Netflix people in charge can you kind of can we get can we make that happen are they gonna do the thing again where they like give you a couple episodes and then you have to wait a bunch of months and then there's like the last two or something i hope not but i'm not mad if they do as long as it's timely yeah we need to i had even forgotten about that it's been so long oh i love stranger things that was good it is so good entrepreneurship that one I go to, it's stressful, but worth it. And again, just kind of coming from my own, you know, being a solo private practice, mental health clinician, it's like you have to put in a lot of work, 
a lot of time, but it's also like all yours, right? So it feels very just sort of full circle worth it in that way. But I also, again, like to, to bring in like don't – don't make it your only thing. Make sure that you have balance. That was part of the reason I wanted to be out on my own as an entrepreneur is to have that sense of like, I can create balance in my life and not that sense of like, I need to be hustling all the time, constantly posting things, constantly, you know, trying to find new business, new clients, things like that. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing if you don't take it too far. Do you do teletherapy? Yes. Okay. I kind of got a mixture of the two. I just, uh, it, it popped in my head and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm curious about that because to me that just seems like, I'm hoping that like that's, it seems like such a logical accessibility option mm-hmm. and I'm hoping like it's really helping to make more people able to actually connect with the therapy that they may need. I think it's really great in a like accessibility. So some of the clients I see telehealth are like in the more rural areas or they're disabled and they can't really get in and out of their house. Or even if they have like mental health conditions that are like overwhelming with like a lot of anxiety or something. And it's a huge struggle to even get to an office to be able to connect and work with them, you know, some of them that I've worked with for years and eventually finally come into the office and that's like a huge success. So I love it for that reason and for the sense of, you know, sometimes it's really hard to find a good therapist for yourself in a community. I notice that a lot with, you know, people of color that sometimes it's really hard. You know, you want to find a a therapist that identifies with you and can understand your situation. So telehealth opens that up where you don't have to drive like a million miles to see somebody that you're going to be really comfortable with. Facts. Last word, diversity. I was thinking about this one a lot. Our, our current climate has created it as such a like loaded word. And I don't really understand that because to me, diversity, it really is like so beautiful and so important and we're all, like, it's become this this thing and this, like, so what do I want to say? This way to divide, which is so weird. Like, if you embrace diversity or equity and inclusion, like, this is a, a woke thing or whatever people want to say. It's like, we're all diverse in some way, shape, or form. We all have things that, that make us unique and beautiful Facts. and different. And that's what I love about people. I don't want to engage with people that are exactly like me because I know me and I'm boring. Like, I want to learn and grow from other people. And just focusing on, you know, basically genetics or biological facts like skin color or ethnicity, it, it doesn't make any sense to base, like, so much on those things because there's a lot of commonalities between people regardless of their skin color or their ethnicity, And there's a lot of things that are just so different that you learn from. Like, again, like the food and the culture and the ways of thinking and music. If I hadn't, you know, moved away from this area, I don't know that I would have experienced as much of that and just grown to really, really value that in my life. And to value the things about me that are diverse, too. Like, I'm a quirky, weird person person and I love that and I love being able to offer that to other people so I love diversity I wish it didn't hadn't created an environment or in our world where it it has some kind of weird negative connotation sometimes because it's the most beautiful thing it's only politics they needed an enemy they needed an enemy and that was one of those things and don't even get me started on woke (laughs) this is just dumb it is so dumb because no one knows what it means (laughs) No, seriously. It, it, no one knows what it means. No one's walking around saying, I am woke. And the people that are calling everybody woke, if you ask them, what does that mean? None of them have an answer. Yeah, they can't say. They don't know. And I feel like it was hijacked from African-American culture and other people have made it ridiculous. <laughs> like, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. I would love to be woke. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with that. When I'm awake, good things happen. (laughs) When I'm asleep, I'm out of control. Like, why? No, that's so fair. And that's all the woke we need, (laughs) y'all. Gee, I tell you. Okay. Next segment. The next segment is called the Kosh Hidden Gems. This is your opportunity to share a hidden gem with Kosh listeners. That can be something that 
everybody knows about, but maybe they don't know these details about it. Or maybe it's something that we don't know about. What do you got for us, Nicole? I think some of them I already talked about. Taqueria, New Moon, Beckett's. But the other one that I didn't bring up is the Touch of Class Pet Resort. Those people there are so good and so kind and so wonderful with, like, my dog is like my little kiddos. I don't have kids, so I, like, treat her like a child, probably detrimentally sometimes. But they are so good with her. They take such good care of her. Debbie and Crystal are just so good. Like, my dog cannot wait to go and say hello to these people and spend her time there. And I feel so happy and safe leaving her in their care that it takes away a lot of that anxiety. Like, if I have to go on vacation, I always have that guilt anxiety. Like, is my dog okay? But with them, I never have that. And I know they always have her best interests at heart. And they're always giving you, like, oh, try this. Or if this is happening, do this. They're so knowledgeable and so kind. I just love them. Is this a is this a groomer? Is this a a pet setting or daycare, pet daycare? Is this what is it? It's kind of all of the above. So they do doggy daycare, they do boarding, and they have a groomer that works there who is also really, really wonderful. So they do all of the things and help you with and they have a little shop with like different kinds of foods and different treats. They even have Ben and Jerry's dog ice cream. So when I'm enjoying my Ben and Jerry's, my dog can also enjoy some. Oh, your dog is spoiled. She is so spoiled. I thought Bosco was bad. (laughs) And he is. (laughs) If you knew just what happened, gosh, listeners, Bosco literally just ran in the room like Kramer with a toy. (laughs) And then he just ran out of here. And yeah. Yep, I'm important. Yeah, that's Bosco. Okay. Well, you know what? We are going to take a quick commercial break. Did you know there are children in the Fox Valley in need of hearing aids, but their parents struggle to provide them because of lack of insurance or high copays? I am Juliette Sturkins, audiologist and board member of Here in the Fox Cities, and proud that this small local nonprofit organization has helped fund hearing aids for some 30 kids. Your donation would help more children hear. Visit hereinthefoxcities.org to learn more and to see their smiles. Every child deserves to hear. All right, gosh, listeners, we are back. And it is now time for what is my favorite segment of the Kosh, and that is story time. This is an opportunity for our guests to tell the Kosh listeners a story. That story can be about absolutely anything. So, Nicole, I am excited. What do you got for us? Well, I mentioned earlier, so mini story is about my last name, which is Millard, which is got an E in it. I had, um, when I was teaching in Vegas, there was a principal that used to joke to remember it. He's because I worked for Miller Middle School. (laughs) And he's like, well, you're just the past tense of our school. So you you've been Millard. (laughs) I'm like, that's great. That's awesome. But throughout my whole life, because Millard is not a very common spelling, And the A-R-D, the Millard part, is the more common. People have always been, you know, mispronouncing it as Millard. Occasionally really strange things. Like for a really long time in high school, my library card said Malero. And I don't understand why, but it became this joke in my house. (laughs) Well, we called ourselves the Maleros for no good reason. But the weird part about people mispronouncing it and putting the A instead of the E is because at some point in my original family, it was Millard. And as I go back and look at the Ancestry.com and all that kind of stuff, there's been various times where I think people's handwriting was so bad that the A looked like an E or the E looked like an A and vice versa. So when it came down to my grandfather and my dad in within, so there were seven siblings, and they all have different spellings of the, the name. Like some of us are Millard, some of them are Millard. My grandfather apparently was Millard and then Millard. <laughs> it all depended. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. I tried to ask my uncle about this at 
you know, my other uncle's funeral a while back. And he was like, well, we always joke that it just depended on, you know, the time of day, because if the doctor delivering us was in the morning, then we got the ARD. If it was the afternoon, it was the ERD. <laughs> so I still have no answer. I don't understand why half my family has a different name. <laughs> it's that, really weird. That is kind of awesome. It is very strange. So if you're Millard, I might be related to you. You never know. My other little story is... And I think the most important story of my life is just the sense of like when I was in fifth grade, I remember coming home from school and my mom telling me we were moving to Las Vegas and just feeling like, you know, whatever the child version of WTF is. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is crazy. This is out of control. At first, as a kid, you know, you're pretty like, oh, this is going to be new and exciting and interesting or whatever. So I remember like reading all these books about Las Vegas and talking about slot machines and people winning like millions of dollars and stuff like that. Then the time comes to actually do it. So it was four days. It was like June 27th or 8th, a couple of days before the 4th of July. And that's when we were going to move. And we got, so this was 1988. There was no like GPS to help us out. I think we had an atlas and we had my uncle and my dad's friend that he had been in Vietnam with who had a little bit of PTSD symptoms and it was a little bit eccentric driving our, it was like a rider truck. It wasn't even a U-Haul. I don't know if U-Hauls were the thing back then, but it was a yellow rider truck. So they were driving that and me, my dad, my mom, and my two brothers and our dog (laughs) We're driving in this old yellow LTD. I don't even know what kind of car it was. It was like, felt like a boat to me back then. We were driving. We're going to drive from Oshkosh to Las Vegas. And in doing this, again, it was just so weird to not have maps. We were trying to coordinate with these other people in a truck who didn't have, you know, no cell phones. So we're just trying to actually follow each other and had like, meeting points here and there that we were supposed to meet each other but then sometimes like missing one another and there was one point in Colorado where we had to drive up to like Pike's Peak I felt like it was so it was very high and the elevation was crazy because we were dropping my dad's army buddy off at this place in Colorado and then we were supposed to meet up with my uncle later at a hotel or something I can't even really remember what the sex like what was going on But because we had to drop off the friend, we had to take my four-year-old brother, and he had to go in the rider truck. So he was just cruising around Colorado in a rider truck with my uncle as a four-year-old, and apparently just, like, stopping and getting random, like, ice cream and pizza and stuff like that. Well, we were driving him to drop him off, and then somehow, like, we missed each other for a significant amount of time, and my brother is just, like, cruising around somewhere in Colorado with my uncle, which I imagine had to be somewhat terrifying for my mom. Like, hey, your youngest child is just like somewhere. Maybe it didn't matter. It was like the 80s. They didn't care. (laughs) He's telling me this story. And I was just like, oh my God, like that would be so terrifying to not know know, where everybody was. And then somehow we all eventually got to the same place. I think we found them at a gas station. And I kind of remember this, like, because this gas station had a, camel and an elephant just hanging out at a gas station what i mean you mean a real live one yeah what and i remember thinking like where are we going and what is happening like there is a literal camel (laughs) bruh then we end up we're at a hotel we're all out of control gorman's hopped that's the younger brother he's hopped up on sugar from whatever the heck my uncle has been doing with him all day so we're like jumping on beds and making all this noise and then they come and threaten to like kick us out because we're making all this noise and everybody around us is complaining and then you know eventually we we calm down because you know we didn't want to face the wrath ended up like driving back to the vegas and moving there where again i lived for like 18 years and It's funny, like, for a long time, I was, like, really mad at my parents because they they brought me away from my friends and my family and that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, you're so mean, and you just messed up my life. But now, like, looking back on on it as an adult and just, like, 
realizing how many new people I met and new things I experienced. And I actually had friends of various like races and cultures and ethnicities. And like, I had such a diverse group of people around me then, like that was so valuable. And, you know, before anything, you know, before my dad passed away, I remember just saying to him, like, I know I was such a snot, but thank you for doing that. Cause I love how broadened my horizons are and how that I can appreciate and understand diversity more because it was a part of my life and not just like this, this concept that existed on the internet or whatever that maybe would have been if I would have stayed here. That, that was really good. I like that story. It's nice. I like that it had, a, if I could go back in time, I'd tell myself to calm down and stop being such a snot and just enjoy because some of my best friends now too are still people that live back there and it's just, it's so wonderful to have experienced things outside of the norm and to, oh my God, my one, one of my best friends, her mom is Thai and the food, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. Okay. Well, it is time. Every single time. Love it. Love it. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Just It just makes you in that space of happiness. That sound means, though, that it is time for the topic of the week. And our topic of the week is chosen by our guest 99.9% of the time. This week is no different. So, Nicole, what is our topic of the week? Well, my initial thought is the sense of what... The way our country right now is treating black women, I just think it's a problem. Bruh. Facts. And I see this, you know, the example that's most recent is how Jasmine Crockett is being treated in Congress where they're acting like she is somehow acting inappropriately for just like basically standing up for herself while allowing that Marjorie Taylor Greene woman to be insanely offensive and racist and ridiculous and you know acting like her part is like okay and somehow founded it and again like focusing on the fact that you know she shouldn't be reacting to this woman it's like no you should be reacting to that woman that's not appropriate that woman shouldn't be there in my opinion but that's my opinion but you are valid in your reaction to those things she's saying to you they're racist and ridiculous and it really riles me up (laughs) And it it goes back to how I see women in our community treated as well. The the sense of like Lakeisha Hazi not being able to be elected 100%, I think it's because people are having preconceived notions about black women and it it hurts my soul. It, It goes to clients I've worked with in the prison system that later released and how you know, when they advocate for themselves, they are labeled as an angry black woman because they are justifiably angry at the way themselves and their children are being treated. And that, you know, women should learn from black women. First of all, all of us, like we shouldn't just roll over and take crap. And this is my, you know, more feminist side speaking for sure. But like, no, like stop, stop trying to make that bad stop trying to make people just speaking up and saying like this is wrong and doing it in a, an effective manner like stop it <laughs> facts look that whole scenario that happened i mean i don't get it because all i i watched the video and all she did was ask a question that seemed appropriate yeah she was just trying to understand what are the parameters mm-hmm. you know and what's even more funny is I think people didn't get it, couldn't get upset because they didn't even understand what really had happened in, in real time, mm-hmm. you know, with the bleach blonde <laughs> scenario. But I, and I personally, I didn't, okay, let's be honest. There's like two types of internet out there, right? There's, there's the internet internet and then there's like black internet. <laughs> <laughs> there just is. And on black internet, she's a hero like that, that uh, everything went viral. 
I didn't even know what had happened. The next <laughs> thing I woke up in the morning, I'm watching this video. I'm dying laughing. I was like, this happened in our Congress. We should be embarrassed. Like, this is the state of where we are at. I am not mad at what she did because that was just self-defense. If anything, they should be mad that, you know, you got this person who really isn't a serious politician. They haven't done anything. They just rabble rouse. Yes. And they were to the point that now we're name calling and, you know, and there's a, there's a history of other things that they have done and somehow, somehow that, that, that's okay. There's always excuses made for that kind of person. There's always like ways to, to make it like acceptable. And I, I'm not down with that. Like that's, if somebody is disrespecting you in that manner, yes, you speak up and you say it. No, and you're allowed to clap back. Oh, facts. Ugh, it just irritates me. And again, like, stop stop making it a bad thing for a woman, particularly a black woman, to stand up for herself and be assertive because we need more of that. We need people to say, like, no, this is un- unacceptable. We need to change this. And I- even if you look at it historically, black women have always been kind of like those positive disruptors, you know, those vehicles for change and they never ever get the credit for it somebody always comes and takes the the credit away or tries to even like I don't know make it less palatable I guess is what I'm trying to say it just irritates me on such a level that these things are allowed to happen and I want us to learn from people like Jasmine Crockett and not you know allow things like that happen anymore I think she should be president (laughs) I, I would vote I would mobilize for that woman she is awesome even before the scenario the other you know when she was talking about like the trials and the impeachment and stuff she's just oh she you know it's it's just funny well you know her and and mgt have uh or mtg is it i get that right yeah yep have history and that's like her their arch nemesis (laughs) like they're constantly battling but MTG never wins. It's not even close. Like, why do you keep doing that? It's almost embarrassing. Like, every time there's some ridiculousness, and then all of a sudden there's this knee drop, elbow drop, choke hold, the whole nine. It never ends well for her, and it's always embarrassing. I'm just saying. It is. And no one cares about her her statement of fake eyelashes, but this other statement, oh, my God, it's printed on t-shirts right and it was beautiful it was alliteratively beautiful as like an english person i was like yeah i can appreciate that so much better than and again like you're lame with your other disrespect it's disrespectful but it's a lame disrespect from marjorie whatever her name is i just don't like you know not to even choose a side in the politics i just don't like where we're at with it like yeah are we really getting stuff done? No, not at all. And that, like, you know, and and I said this. I said, you know, I have made the statement, and I, and I and I do mean this. Like, if there was ever a point in time where, if someone called it out and said, you know what, you want the best job in the world, go get in Congress. You don't have to literally do anything, and you get paid a lot of money to do nothing. You can just disagree with whatever the other side does and hope that you never truly have to actually legislate like as a taxpayer we should be mad i'm very mad and again that's why i love jasmine crockett like she was pointing that very thing out with the whole like let's try to impeach joe biden about whatever random thing they came up with she's like stop wasting taxpayers time this is ridiculous yeah like let's Let's do some work. Let's create some systems that actually work instead of, you know, arguing while the status quo remains. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't understand. Okay. And my other little shout out I kind of wanted to to give, or not shout out, like that's the wrong word. But as I was driving here, I was listening to the radio and it came on that today was the fourth anniversary of the death of George Floyd. And I just, I, I really feel that heaviness today. I'm glad I got to come here and have this wonderful conversation that kind of gave me back some of my lightness. But initially that just felt really heavy because I was hopeful. I'm always hopeful that change is coming and it just seems like it's never really coming. And that 
that affected me so much like that like with so many people right just that visceral like you're watching somebody die on live because this man is like horrible and overwhelmed with power and dead behind the eyes or whatever the reasons were and these things keep going on and it just I felt heavy this morning so I just wanted to acknowledge that and I don't think we ever can stop acknowledging that because we have to keep moving forward what I would say and this is my perspective is um I think a ton of difference happened because of George Floyd and needles that never would have been moved, at least not any time in recent time would have ever been moved without the things that happened. I hate that he, that his demise had to happen the way that it happened, that he even had a demise at all. You know, bless that, bless that young man, bless him and his family. But true change did happen. And timing of it like the whole world was on pause so they looked people that would have normally ignored they they couldn't ignore because they had time nothing was moving nothing was happening so you had time to watch this happen and no one could justify it it was incredibly powerful and change happened and to me and uh you know lasting change happened in a lot of ways uh, of course, it's never perfect. Um, but what I always do want to remind us is like, um, we never move the needle as far as we feel we should have. And because needle moving is slow. <laughs> oh, my God, is it slow? Right. But I don't ever want us also to not celebrate the the change in the winds, because if we don't ever take those times to do it, and we're always in this space of like, it's not enough or we didn't do enough or enough didn't happen. It's hard to create the next pathway for more progress. Like sometimes we got to stop and say, oh, that did happen. And here's some good because of it or, or things of that such. And we just need to acknowledge progress, no matter how small it is, that there was some. Now I do also feel like, you know, we, we are we in a space where we're moving backwards? I don't think we're moving backwards right now, but I do think we're in a space of holding frame. Like we're not in a f- space of moving forward. And I'm just going to call that out to the political climate at this time that moving forward right now might be just holding frame to make sure we're not moving backwards. I will take that. I, I do have a sense of impatience, I think. And probably some of that is my own white privilege where I feel like things need to move a lot more effectively and efficiently oh no look we look there's a whole lot of us who who feel like it would be nice if this thing moved faster quickly and had more in some cases a more lasting effect and that it didn't doesn't feel trendy per se but i i as a person who professionally works in the space i'm also like we it's hard to keep finding it's hard to keep fighting and finding more allies and, and people to help make our spaces more inclusive and more belonging and, and to be more thoughtful of our neighbors and our and the people in our community if every once in a while we don't sit back and say, let's have a barbecue. No. <laughs> right. That sounds amazing. And, and I mean, just acknowledging like that space has moved. And it, even if it's just a little bit and then uh, we take a breath and then we get back out there and we, we start pushing again. I appreciate that you're out there pushing. My best. It doesn't feel like enough, but. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So Nicole, is there any last words you would like to say, or is there any last things you'd like to say about your topic? Before we start wrapping up, I think that's most of it. Maybe I'll, I'll try to use my DBT again. So another part about the the DBT is a sense of the balance of acceptance and change. So accepting what is right now, so that you're not allowing it to to fester and create, you know, that sense of like living in the stress, while also continuing to work towards change of a better world, a better life. Thank you. Okay, Kosh listeners, you know what that sound means. 
it is time for us to start wrapping up this episode. Uh, first, let me just say thank you to Nicole for being a guest. Um, Kaish listeners, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you for giving us your minds and ears. Thank you for caring about this community and the people in it and therefore tuning into this podcast to learn about your neighbors and who lives here and all this talent and amazing uh, humanness that's walking around here. Um, As you know, we are a work in progress. We are trying to become the number one podcast in Wisconsin. Um, And we need your help to be able to do that. How can you help? Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, Let us know, like, is there new segments you would like? Are there more questions you would like? Are there new ways you want us to ask things? Let us know. How can we improve this show? Uh, Also, if you would like to be a guest, if you would like to recommend a guest, uh, please, please, please reach out to us at askthekosh at gmail.com. Once again, that is askthekosh at gmail.com. That is actually how we got Nicole here today, was a reach out from Nicole and apparently a little nudge from her partner named Jason. Big shout out, Jason. Big, big shout out. Um, And those things make a difference. That's how we get these amazing episodes. Also, Kosh listeners, help us. Help us with our analytics if we have better analytics, more eyes and ears get to learn about the cash. And what, what does that mean? While you're listening right now, hit the subscribe button. And if you got a few more moments, take the time and fill out a review. Let us know how we are doing good, bad, or indifferent. But these are the things. They don't cost any money. They don't cost a dime. But it would mean a lot to the cash here if you could do those things. And that will help get the word out about this amazing amazing podcast okay now now that we've got that wrapped up oh and let me just send a shout out to out there to if you are a nonprofit out there doing work and you would like an opportunity i give away free commercials to nonprofits so if you would like an opportunity to come and record a commercial and we'll play it here on the cash please don't hesitate if you are a business local business and you would like an opportunity to have a commercial on the cash let's talk and we can create a little something here for you too at a very very fair sponsorship okay now it is the real time to really make some things happen right now one of my favorite times you know what time it is that is shout out time nicole Definitely my own shout out again to Jason for all of his encouragement and support. My counseling practice is called Looking Glass Counseling. Reach out if you are interested in learning more. Also, the building I work in, um, Venue 404, is a super cool historic building. It also was where Public Enemies was filmed. And they do a lot of stuff there with like wedding venues or they can cater event or, or not cater events, but they hold events and you can have stuff catered in Thursday nights. He has a little happy hour in the speakeasy bar in the basement. So it's got a real cool little vibe to come check that out if you haven't already. And like I said, Taqueria, touch of class, just kind of like my favorite places here in Oshkosh, Beckett's. Okay, I'm going to call you out and say, Nicole, can we do a better job on telling people about your business? Come on now, where's the information? Uh, Where's this contact info? Well, you can contact me through Psychology Today. If you look up my name, Nicole Millard, I have a page there. It's probably the easiest. You can email me, Nicole Millard, M-I-L-L-E-R-D, at looking, or no. Nicole Millard at foxvalleycounseling.com. This is how little I actually email myself. I have an old email address. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think this important web page. I don't have a specific one. I go through the psychology today. So if you go on there, you can search my name. I think it's like psychology today's backslash Nicole Millard, something like that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
my shout outs this week. A uh, big shout out to the Chicago House of Hoagies and Lona. Went there twice this week. Took, took, took one of my colleagues from work and took one of my fraternity brothers there. Lona's always feeding us well with some yummy yumminess. If you don't know, check out that episode. You will learn about 10 minute shoes. That is something that was a new lesson that I never knew about. I want to send a big shout out to my man, Big T, my fraternity brother, Solo T spending time with me and he's working on a new podcast and a youtube channel and i'm i'm trying to be helpful where i can because you know i might know a little little something about that space just want to send a shout out to elridge out here doing dei work uh my friend elridge has come up with a curriculum for faith-based people dealing with diversity and i just think that's a brilliant thing to do in a brilliant space focused on those so if you are a church out there or a faith-based organization and you need somebody to come in and maybe talk about diversity in a way that that would be respectful using language to your faith or faith ba- to faith-based community members. I got a little contact for you. You can reach out to me. I can make that connection for you. I want to send a shout out to my man, Rod, who has become a bus driver. Congratulations, my man. A uh, big, big shout out there. I want to send a shout out to Miriam who had her book release. Hey, congratulations. I am envious only because one day I want to write a book, but that is amazing. And I hope that worked out well. And then as we do in every shout out episode, I would like to end with a big shout out to my wife for once again, allowing us to continue to, do podcasting in her house. (laughs) I love you, baby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now it is the wrap up. There is only one more thing left to do, Nicole. And that is this. You have three choices. A, B, and C. Choice A. Please share with us some words of wisdom, some parting words of wisdom for the Kosh listeners. Option B, share with us, what would yourself today tell your 13-year-old self? And option C, you can do both because we're not really binary here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think option C, yes, both, because that's a hard, hard choice. I'll start with what I would say to my 13-year-old self if I could go back in time I think, first of all, I give her a big hug, tell her it's going to be okay, and that she doesn't have to be angry, she doesn't have to be sad, that things are going to turn out different than she imagined, but in a lot, a lot of ways, just better. So it's all going to be good. You are loved, young self, and you're going to be okay. That's such a powerful, I love that question. Like, it's a very... Sometimes, you know, I use it as a therapist to kind of write a letter to your younger self and really express some of the things because those those younger parts of us, my my younger sort of teenage self is just very angry and confused and she needed a lot of work of her own in therapy. So going back and giving her some love here and there is always something that I love doing. And I think everybody, it's, it's just so powerful. Facts. Awesome. And if I were... To add any words of wisdom, I think it's, you know, A, as a therapist, give therapy a try. Again, like any stigma that remains, you know, let's let's let that go and really give it a try because you your physical health and your mental health are important and they're so closely intertwined that if you can kind of find somebody that you vibe with and you can share some of your story and you can work through some of your individual traumas the freedom that comes from that is amazing and the changes it can make in your life and your outlook on the life. It, it just really is beautiful. So I encourage everybody to give it a try. And if you find, you know, one therapist doesn't work for you, like that's cool. Find somebody else. It's just like any other relationship, right? You have to find the right fit and keep looking until you find that right fit because it's, it's so val- valuable and just, you know, you are worth giving that a try and i want everybody to know that that we are all enough just period facts big fat facts 
All right. Nicole, what you think? This was fun and outside of my comfort zone, so I love it. <laughs> yes, the cash.